Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm here to make an important foreign policy announcement concerning the Islamic Republic of Iran. Um, today, the United States is continuing to build its maximum pressure campaign against the Iranian regime. I am announcing our intent to designate the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, including its Quds Force, as a foreign terrorist organization in accordance with Section 219 of the Immigration and Nationality Act. Uh, this designation will take effect one week from today. This is the first time that the United States has designated a part of another government as an FDO. We're doing it because the Iranian regime's use of terrorism as a tool of statecraft makes it fundamentally different from any other government. This historic step will deprive the world's leading state sponsor of terror, the financial means to spread misery and death around the world. Businesses and banks around the world now have a clearer duty to ensure that companies with which they conduct financial transactions are not connected to the IRGC in any material way. It also gives the U.S. government additional tools to counter Iranian-backed terrorism. This designation is a direct response to an outlaw regime and should surprise no one. And it builds on the more than 970 Iranian individuals and entities that the Trump administration has already sanctioned. For 40 years, the Islamic Republic's Revolutionary Guard Corps has actively engaged in terrorism and created, supported, and directed other terrorist groups. The IRGC masquerades as a legitimate military organization, but none of us should be fooled. It regularly violates the laws of armed conflict. It plans, organizes, and executes terror campaigns all around the world. From the moment it was founded, the IRGC's mandate was to defend and export the regime's revolution by whatever means possible. The RGC institutionalized terrorism shortly after its inception, directing horrific attacks against the Marine barracks in Beirut in 1983 and the U.S. Embassy Annex in 1984, alongside the terror group it midwifed, Lebanese Hezbollah. Its operatives have worked to destabilize the Middle East from Iraq to Lebanon to Syria and to Yemen. With this designation, the Trump administration is simply recognizing a basic reality. The IRGC will take its rightful place on the same list as terror groups it supports. Lebanese Hezbollah, Palestinian Islamic Jihad, Hamas, Khatib Hezbollah, among others, all of which are already designated as foreign terrorist organizations. The long list of IRGC backed terror incidents is ample justification for today's decision. I want to just give you a handful of examples. Last September, a federal court in the United States found Iran and the IRGC responsible for the 1996 Kobar Towers bombing, bombing, which killed 19 American service members. In 2011, the United States foiled an IRGC Quds Force Plus right here in Washington, D.C. to bomb a restaurant. The attempt was to kill the Saudi ambassador to the United States of America. Outside of the United States, the IRGC's terror campaign is just as active. In 2012, four Quds Force operatives were apprehended after plotting to attack Israeli targets in Turkey. In that same year, two other Quds Force operatives were arrested in Kenya for planning a bomb attack, while the Quds Force also directed a bomb attack that targeted Israeli diplomats. And as recently as January 2018, German authorities uncovered 10 suspected Quds Force operatives active in their country. The IRGC supports Palestinian terror groups that target in the civilians, and it helped create U.S. designated terror groups both in Lebanon and in Iraq. And the IRGC also backs the murderous Assad regime, which gasses and slaughters its own people. Our designation makes clear to the world that the Iranian regime not only supports terrorist groups, but engages in terrorism itself. This designation also brings unprecedented pressure on figures who lead the, the regime's terror campaign, individuals like Qasem Soleimani. He's the commander of the Quds Force and oversees Iran's forces deployed to advance the Islamic Revolution through terrorism and other forms of violence. He doles out the regime's profits to terrorist groups across the region and around the world. The blood of the 603 American soldiers the Iranian regime as founder of killed in Iraq is on his hands and on the hands of the IRGC more broadly. Inexplicably, the regime has faced no accountability from the international community for those deaths. Far from being an arbitrary attack on Iran, our pressure campaign imposes just and long overdue consequences for the regime's malign activity. 
we should not also forget the RGC's central role in the nationwide con artistry and corruption of the regime's leaders, which they perpetrate against the regime's own people. Other governments in the private sector will now see more clearly how deeply the IRGC has enmeshed itself in the Iranian economy through both licit and illicit means. In just this past July, the City Council of Tehran announced that the IRGC Cooperative Foundation, which manages the IRGC's investments, has embezzled more than $1 billion from the city of Tehran. The next month, a former council member accused the longtime mayor of, of Tehran of steering contracts to the IRGC. It's no coincidence that the mayor also formally served as an IRGC commander and the chief of Iran's police state. Back in 2017, Tehran arrested several IRGC commanders involved with the Cooperative Fund for Corruption, including the IRGC's financial architect, Masoud Mirdadi. Then there's Mahmoud Ahmadinejad's old college pal, Sadiq Mousili. They call him the billionaire general. He went from being a low-level IRGC officer to one of Iran's richest men, all thanks to scoring construction and oil contracts from companies linked to the IRGC. The leaders of Iran are racketeers, not revolutionaries. The Iranian people deserve better than to be governed by this cadre of hypocritical and corrupt officials. They are opportunists. And on a final note, the IRGC is also responsible for wrongly detaining U.S. persons, several of whom remain in captivity in Iran. The American people should know that we are working diligently to bring each of those individuals home. With this designation, we are sending a clear signal, a clear message to Iran's leaders, including Qasem Soleimani and his band of thugs, that the United States is bringing all pressure to bear to stop the regime's outlaw behavior. We ask that our allies and partners around the world do the same. Thank you. Secretary, it's time for one or two questions, and we'll have an additional opportunity with uh, some others. I'll go on. <coughs> Thank you so much, Mr. Secretary. Uh, uh, Jawad Zarif has said today that there will be consequences for U.S. forces in the region uh, after the designation, and he addressed President Trump, saying that he should know better than to be coned into another U.S. disaster. What's your answer? And uh, secondly, news reports say that the U.S. is considering uh, sanctions on uh, Lebanese, uh, the head of the parliament, of the Lebanese speaker, Nabi Berri, uh, because of his ties with Hezbollah and Iran. Can you confirm that? So, your, sec your second question. Uh, on my most recent trip to Beirut, made clear to uh, the Lebanese leadership, including in conversations with Speaker Berry, uh, that uh, America was not going to tolerate the continued rise of Hezbollah inside of the country, that it wasn't in the best interest of the Lebanese people uh, to have a ter armed terror group underwritten by the very Iran that we're speaking about today um, continue to have significant sway inside of that nation by use of force. This, this isn't about political parties. This is about armed forces inside the country of Lebanon. We made very clear that we were going to continue to evaluate sanctions for all those that were connected to the risk that was created to the Lebanese people. As for the first question, uh, I've seen Foreign Minister Zarif uh, make many statements before. We have made clear, uh, both, uh, both uh, publicly and privately, uh, that an attack on the United States of America is something that uh, they ought to think more than twice about. I'll hurry up, Mr. Secretary, um, I asked you this question two weeks ago, and you didn't seem to be sure about it. Now that you have listed them, I'm wondering what has changed. Now you have listed them as a terrorist organization. Will you treat them like ISIS and Al-Qaeda? In other words, will you target uh, Qasem Soleimani like you target Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi? And on a, a separate uh, note, um, Pre Prime Minister Netanyahu said that he wants to annex part of the West Bank today. What's your reaction to that? Will that undermine the, the peace plan? Yeah, I don't have comments on either one of in response to either one of those questions. I'll, I'll leave. When you say target, you're usually talking about things that the Department of Defense does. I'll allow them to mm -hmm. uh, to respond to that question. Thank you. One more, Mr. Secretary. Sure. Okay, so, uh, Go ahead. Thank you. Um, how are you? Um, quick ones. Um, how will this affect um, EU trade? oil waivers, um, since the IRGC is involved in most parts of the Iranian economy. So the question, including, you know, banking and everything else, so how does this affect yeah. those relations? And number two, how, if you're, um, you said often that you want to bring Iran back to the, this is aimed at 
forcing Iran back to the negotiating table. Do you believe that this would help bring them back, or is that no longer your your aim here? So I think what we've said before is we want Iran to behave like a n normal nation. We laid out 12 things that they needed to do back in what would have been almost a year ago, May of last year. Uh, that's the mission. That's the mission of this designation as well. Uh, so that's our purpose. If you said, what's the intent? It's to, it's to achieve the outcomes that we laid out back in uh, back in May of last year to get the Islamic Republic around to do the simple thing like uh, not launch missiles into Saudi Arabia, risking American lives uh, each and every day. Uh, what was your – remind me of your first question? And then the first one is yeah. how does this affect things like EU so, trade? So, yeah. So here's the simple answer to that. If you're the general counsel for a European financial institution today, there's more risk. Uh, there, it, it is absolutely the case that uh, the IRGC – amounts to a significant piece of the Iranian economy through pure kleptocracy. And it is also the case that it is sometimes difficult to know whether the IRGC is involved. That is, the diligence effort is an enormous undertaking. I think this, uh, I think this will require more diligence be done by every business that is considering doing things that are even now uh, second and third orders removed from what you might think of as a, a traditional connection uh, to the Iranian economy. This, this, this extends to, to your point about trade. Uh, or you asked about oil waivers. We'll, we'll make that decision in due course uh, as we move towards May 2nd, but it, this absolutely uh, extends the uh, and creates clarity around uh, those transactions that create risk for companies not just in Europe, but frankly all over the world. Was that one of your goals, Mr. Thank Secretary, to Thank shut you all down very much. the Thank you all very business? Much. We now have uh, a special representative for Iran and senior advisor and Secretary of State Brian Hook. And our assistant secretary for counterterrorism, David Sale, may be happy to take additional questions. Please. The start Associated Press, Matt. So um, I'm just curious. It, this has been obviously under consideration for a while. Previous administrations have considered it as well, but opted not to do it. And one of the reasons was uh, has been for not doing it to date that it creates complications, of, particularly in, in, in Iraq, but also in Lebanon and elsewhere for American soldiers, but also American diplomats and how they can. So uh, the, are there any um, exclusions, waivers, carve-outs, however you want to call this, that would allow um, the kind of contacts, particularly in Iraq, that American commanders or regular troops might have with people, Iraqi officials, who uh, by virtue of their station have to um, interact with, with IRGC personnel? I'll do the first part and then uh, <clears throat> take on the second part. Um, the, the IRGC has been threatening American troops almost since its inception. And um, whenever we impose sanctions on Iran, it's usually followed by a range of threats. Um, what endangers uh, American <clears throat> troops in the Middle East uh, is an IRGC that operates with impunity. Uh, and, ha and never has its ambitions checked in the Middle East. We're taking an entirely new approach to this, of significant sort of sustained maximum economic pressure to deny the IRGC and the Iranian regime of the revenue that it needs to conduct its foreign policy. And we know that the IRGC has been a principal architect and enforcer of Iran's foreign policy since around 1979, the way the Ayatollah designed the regime. And they are trying to reshape the Middle East in their favor working as a power broker uh, and as a military force. And they assassinate rivals, uh, not only in the Middle East, but in Europe. Uh, they organize, train, and equip these militias all over the Middle East. As we saw in Syria, they direct a network of militant groups. And in the case of Iraq, they've killed over 600 American servicemen. And so we think it's important to, in this case today, we're adding a layer of additional sanctions uh, on the IRGC to make radioactive those sectors of Iran's economy that are influenced or controlled by the IRGC. I'll let Nathan answer your second question. Well, I, I just want to make sure you understand. I'm not talking about threats to U.S. forces and diplomats from Iran. I'm talking about threats to them from potential U.S. prosecution for violating sanctions by doing something that may um, – be construed as providing material support to an IRGC mm -hmm. affiliate or, you know, a, a associate. 
You know, we're, we're not going to answer hypotheticals um, about various cases that, that could be conjured up in the future. We simply don't uh, have anything to say uh, on that. What I can tell you is the United States uh, has a strong interest in an Iraqi government that is strong and stable and, and sovereign and free from malign external influence. Uh, the record of Iranian involvement in the region is not a promising one. Look at Syria, look at Yemen, look at Le Lebanon. Um, we have an interest in making sure that Iraq does not take that road and is able to stand on its own two feet as a strong and prosperous country in its own right. I would just maybe add one thing, that the Middle East cannot be more stable and peaceful without weakening the IRGC. It's just simply not possible. When you study their 40-year history, it's impossible um, to allow the IRGC to continue to operate under this fiction that it's a, a, a benign part of the Iranian government. It is the blunt instrument of Iran's foreign policy, and it has been that way for decades. And what we're doing today is, uh, in addition to the new tools that this gives us, we're also uh, stigmatizing uh, this organization. We're highlighting to the world, as the Secretary just did, um, the perils of working with the IRGC, which by some estimates controls up to or more than half of Iran's economy. NPR, Michelle. Thank you. So does this rule out any sort of contacts with um, anyone connected to the IRGC? And I'm, I'm asking because, you know, in the past, the past admin, last administration had to negotiate with the IRGC to get American hostages out, for instance, um, or at least have some contacts with members of the IRGC. So. Do you not have any kind of contact with people who are holding Americans um, or people who are threatening Americans in places like Iraq? Well, let, let me tell you what the law provides. The law provides that it is a federal criminal offense punishable by up to 20 years in prison for any person who provides material support to a designated foreign terrorist organization. That is what the IRGC will be seven days from today. Now, the application of that law to particular cases, it's impossible to predict in advance what that's going to look like. We simply don't want to get into hypothetical situations. But the point of this designation that the Secretary just announced is to render the IRGC radioactive. And so all businesses, all foreign officials um, who are thinking about engaging with the IRGC should think long and hard about whether that makes sense. That, that includes U.S. government, American <clears throat> diplomats? Well, we have – this is a tool. The FTO tool is something that we have used since 1993, I want to say over 60 times. And we're still able to execute our diplomacy and our foreign policy but, without but any impediments. this is the first time and you've done it to a, US, to right, a, a government we, entity. That's why I'm asking the doing question. Doing this will not impede our, dipl our, our diplomacy. Thank you. Uh, for taking this. Sir, just to clarify, on Iraq, will you be requiring the Iraqi government, as of now, to turn over any suspected or known uh, members of the uh, Iranian British Marine Guard since you declared them as terrorists? We're not making any demands of the Iraqi government. Um, as I said a moment ago, we share the Iraqi government's interest in ensuring that the government of Iraq is able uh, to represent a proud and free and prosperous people without any undue influence from malign actors. So they will continue to operate freely in Iraq? Uh, don't, it is a criminal offense for any person to provide material support to a designated foreign terrorist organization. How that applies in particular cases, we're simply not going to speculate about right now. Um, warned that if the U.S. Take, took this action, U.S. forces in Western Asia will lose peace and quiet. And it's obviously something we've been talking about, uh, U.S. forces operating very close to the IRGC members in Iraq. So is there more being done to provide safety measures to uh, members of the U.S. military that are in close proximity, or are you confident that they are uh, defended enough against the IRGC at this point? Um, the, the decision leading up to this process was a full interagency process that included uh, every member of the National Security Council. We, we, we have taken all, all measures that are appropriate and prudent in the context of this designation. Um, with respect to Iranian threats, um, when, you, when you play under House rules, the House always wins. And Iran has a very long history of trying to get the world to play by its rules. 
And every time the world calls out this regime for being a mafia racket, the IRGC, as the Secretary said, resembles more a racket than a revolutionary cause. And so whenever we and other nations call out and expose the regime for what it is, it behaves like a mafia organization increasing its threats. And we will not be deterred by their threats. And let me just say, we're not going to get into the details of what we're doing to make sure that our people downrange are safe. I can assure you that we take force protection very, very seriously. Um, and that is why we have run a robust interagency process to make sure that all interested parties are prepared for whatever the Iranian regime might throw at us. CBS, Christina. Thanks. Hi, guys. Can you talk a little bit uh, to Matt and a little bit Kylie's question about the timing of this designation? I know there has been some criticism about, especially now, because U.S. forces are in close proximity, this might put them at risk, which you answered a little bit. But we've, you know, we've been hearing about this for a year. Why now? What was the tipping point that made this designation important this week? Well, it's the next step in our maximum pressure campaign. Um, this administration previously designated the IRGC for providing support to terrorism. Today, we have stripped away the plausible deniability. It's not just that the IRGC supports terrorism that its proxies undertake. Today, the IRGC stands accused and convicted of directly engaging in terrorism itself. Um, this new tool doesn't just add rhetorical heft to our campaign. It has practical, real-world consequences, some of which we've discussed. It's now a federal criminal offense to provide uh, material support to a designated FTO such as IRGC when this takes effect on Monday. The material support statute is an incredibly powerful tool. Since 2001, since 9-11, we've used it to obtain hundreds of convictions. Um, and the sentence for which you are eligible, if convicted, 20-year maximum penalty. So this creates very powerful deterrence um, for anyone who would provide material support to the IRGC or to any other designated organization. Let me just add your, your, your <clears throat> phrasing of that. Can, the Matt, IRGC's. Matt. Go ahead. Brian. Um, we have said from the time the administration came into office that we're going to be taking a new approach to Iran. And you have seen over now two years, um, we've had 25 rounds of sanctions. We've designated almost 1,000 individuals and entities. We left the Iran deal, which has given us enormous diplomatic and economic leverage to go after the full range of threats that Iran presents to peace and security. Um, this is just another chapter, and there will be more chapters to come. Uh, this is a sustained and focused effort uh, at the direction of the President that enjoys the full support of the National Security Cabinet. Can I? Last time, last time you were here, uh, we talked about that 600 number that's been mentioned several to times right. today. You said the Pentagon would give more guidance. They didn't really. Do you have any more context as to how that number was arrived at as the 600? Well, it's, th there have been estimates over many years. I think in the Obama administration, one uh, DOD official said that somewhere north of 500. Uh, it took a while to, I think, pull together all of the information and to be accurate about it. And the number that has come out of the Defense Department is uh, over 600. Uh, Secretary gave the number, I think it's 603. And those are just um, the ones who've been killed. Um, it's, it's an enormous uh, number of Americans who've been maimed and hurt because of Iran's uh, improvised explosive devices. Um, that's only Iraq, which accounts for 17 percent of all of all American service, um, servicemen's deaths in Iraq. That doesn't include Lebanon and the bombings there and, and other terrorist attacks around the world conducted by this regime. This is the, this is the right thing to do. It's long overdue. It does give us a lot of new tools. And there will be more tools to come. Thank you. Matt, you had to well, I just wanted to know what about Ambassador Sales' characterization. Uh, the IRGC stands convicted today. I mean, are you referring to a, a court decision, the one that the Secretary mentioned? I mean, I just, this is a legal term, and it, I'm not aware that they have been convicted of being a foreign terrorist organization. They may well should, you know, that, that, that may well happen, but are you referring to previous cases in where that's happened? Or? Matt, don't be so literal. Um, well, I'm not, I, I just <laughs> wanted to, I mean, it's a legal phrase. You said convicted. So. That was a rhetor rhetorical turn of phrase. Gotcha. With the okay. announcement today, gotcha. which will take effect a week from now, the legal status of the IRGC will change uh, from an organization to a designated foreign terrorist organization. Okay. That was the sense in which I used the phrase. Gotcha. Right. One more question? Yeah. Uh, right here, yeah. please. Yeah. 
Um, earlier on a, a conference call this morning, um, a U.S. administration official said that the IRGC's dual mission is to, is to suppress people at home and the other terrorize um, abroad. Now, is this designation today in any way geared towards the first part of the mission uh, here, suppress people at home? Uh, do you expect this designation to in any way affect how the IRGC uh, treats the people? Within yes, the we do. Yes, we do. The IRGC is responsible for much of the repression at home. When you saw the, uh, the protests in 2009, the detentions, the arrests, the harassment, and then the murders, that is very much an IRGC operation. Um, and so they have been a principal driver uh, of repressing the Iranian people who want a better way of life at home. And so when we deny this organization revenue and we put a black cloud above it, um, it makes it harder for the IRGC to conduct its mission. And they also do this overseas, principally through the Quds Force. And so today's designation is IRGC and Quds Force. And they are, the, of course, IRGC and QF rotate personnel domestically and internationally as uh, Soleimani sees fit. Um, as Qasem Soleimani said in March 2009, the battlefield is mankind's lost paradise. And this is the true nature of Iran's foreign policy. It is not the very nice seeming tweets of, of uh, Iran's foreign minister. If you want to know Iran's foreign policy, pay more attention to what Qasem Soleimani has said and continues to say. Um, he was recently given a medal by the Supreme Leader who wished for his martyrdom. Um, and the Supreme Leader has, has said things, he's been um, uh, lionizing people who, dream, who, who uh, drink the sweet syrup of martyrdom. This regime is in, in many ways a death cult and their foreign policy resembles that with all of this talk about martyrdom. Uh, and it's a very dangerous, dark and brutal regime both for the Iranian people and for those nations who are on the front line of trying to um, respond to Iranian aggression. And we know that Saudi Arabia uh, with the missile launches from Yemen into Saudi, uh, Bahrain, which has is, since 81, the Iranian regime has tried to destabilize and overthrow uh, the, the government there in Bahrain, Lebanon, Syria, the Hezbollah tunnels, the list goes on and on. It is very hard to imagine a peaceful Middle East with a strong Iranian regime. So, Brian, when... Okay. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Oh, yeah, they're good, yeah, man.